It's quite all right. Laughter is allowed. Encouraged, even. Good morning. Good morning. Um, please stand, if you are able, to join me in our opening prayer. Everlasting God, you are our dwelling place, a sanctuary in the midst of cause and confusion. You nurture us in your love and calm our anxieties in your presence. As we enter into this time of worship, help us to hear your words of comfort and feel your arms of peace, that we might be restored in our inner being to know and do your purpose and will. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Marching to Zion, number 733 in the hymnal. Sing me, everyone. I invite you to be seated. Well, welcome to church. It's great to see you all here. And as we uh, continue in our worship together, I invite you to uh, mark the welcome card that is in the pew in front of you. Or for those of you who are joining us online, feel free to comment, say hello, and connect. It uh, helps us know that you are part, uh, part of what's going on in the life of the church and uh, connect with you as well. And uh, of course, if there's any ways that we can be in ministry with you in the next week, please make a note of that. Uh, you can always call me or text me, and I'll be able to respond in those ways. Um, just Go, go for it. It's great to see you guys here. Uh, a couple of things going on as we are gearing up towards uh, what's happening with Lent. A couple of things to be aware of going on is uh, this is the last week, I believe, that uh, we're inviting people to sign up to be a part of this mission trip to Kentucky. And if you are, have any questions or are interested, uh, you can talk with me. Or if you're here uh, in North Haven, you can talk with Dave Adams. He's here with us today. Uh, and certainly any questions or being a part of that. If you don't know if you'd be able to go yourself but like to support somebody who's going, uh, please uh, let us know as well. We'd be glad to have our sponsors uh, come around people as well for this mission trip. 
Uh, a couple of things, as I was mentioning, uh, leading into to Lent, this is the season leading towards Easter. Uh, there is an Ash Wednesday uh, experience. So on Wednesday, the 22nd of February, uh, there is going to be a lunch in Ashes that's happening at Woodsville. And we invite you to be a part of that. That's at 1130. And then here at North Haverhill, 630, we'll be starting with some singing in the Taizé style. It's a very meditative kind of singing. And then we will have uh, worship stations around this uh, sanctuary uh, for you to participate in and to reflect on the meaning of Easter and Lent. And so we invite you to be a part of either of those experiences or both. Uh, it would be a great way for us to begin this Lenten season together. Uh, and connecting with Lent is that part of our tradition is connecting with other churches in the area around Lenten suppers. And so uh, the first Lenten Supper is going to be the 26th of February at 5 o'clock. Uh, it begins at the Monroe United Methodist Church. And you'll see there on the screen the list of the other churches who are participating. Uh, we still have an opening, but we'll get that filled today uh, so that next week we'll have the whole list of churches who will be part of that Lenten experience. Uh, and it's a good way of connecting with other believers in the area and getting a chance to eat together and, again, uh, hearing and considering what it means for us to prepare our hearts for Easter as we get into the Lenten season. Um, also note that there are a number of uh, med health concerns in our community, and I try to keep updating the list. I realized just this week that some of the numbers I called were not right, <laughs> and so I want to make sure I have the right numbers up there. Uh, if you have some concerns or uh, a friend or a neighbor who you feel I'm really concerned about them, uh, let me know. I'd be glad to help you navigate the system of how to help get the help that we need in our community, and so uh, just uh, let me know. I'd be glad to be part of that with you. Do we have any other announcements we want to make sure we share with the community? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, and, fellowship uh, downstairs yeah. after church. And also, um, I want you to notice the um, shawls, and there's more out back. And we also have a Noah's Ark out back with animals. And so we're asking if you need some comfort or uh, you know of somebody that needs some comfort, please take a shawl. And uh, you can take a stuffed animal or if you would like, and also um, we have ladies in the church that make the shawls, so if any of you want to crochet or do a shawl, you may, and uh, purchase some little animals to go in Noah's Ark, because he's getting kind of empty. All but right. they do have to be brand new. Very okay? good. Thank you, Ruthie. So uh, for those who are online, just know Ruthie was describing we have prayer shawls and even prayer animals uh, that can go to those who are looking for comfort and know that uh, those are a symbol of our prayer and care for the, our community. And uh, if you are interested in uh, receiving one of those, uh, please let us know. Uh, and Ruthie is here to help connect with you on that as well. Any other announcements we want to make sure we share together? All right, I'm going to invite us to stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another. Uh, the question I'm asking today is, what helps you find calm? And so if you're online, feel free to put that in the note. Otherwise, uh, I invite you to do so. We might not give the hugs and kisses today, but you might do an elbow bump or a fist bump if you feel, feel led to do that. So our children's moment today, Parker is again our uh, youth representative today. Glad to see you. Let's do that. Boom. Very good. So uh, Parker, I wonder, are you ever afraid of things? And let's just tell you the story. Like when I was a kid, I was often afraid of the dark. Have you ever been afraid of the dark? 
Yeah? So when you're, when you're afraid in the dark, what do you do? I usually hide under my blankets. You hide under your blankets, right, because whatever is going to hurt you cannot penetrate blankets, right? <laughs> right, exactly, right. Because you know, I figured if I was always watching, that monster could not escape the closet because my looking at it would keep the monster at bay, right? It makes a lot of sense. I used to have a night light, and that was always very helpful. Now, you know, in life we have a lot of things that we can be concerned about, worried about, anxious about, right? We could be concerned about food, we can be concerned about do I look right, do I get the right clothes? I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, and I can be really worried about these things. And Jesus knows that we often worry about these things, but he had some good words for his disciples and for us to hear today. And what do you think Jesus was trying to help us to learn? What do you think Jesus would say? How to be scared and not to be worried. Not to be worried, not to be scared. And indeed, that's what he says. Don't worry. He says, trust God. So we can trust God in our worries. And uh, do you think that's something we can do? All right. So we're going to pray and we're going to thank God. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. And for being with us when we're feeling scared and worried. And thank the high radio to call the kids. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, thank you, Parker. All right, we can invite you to go to this uh, Sunday School Teachers today. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet our Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. singing everyone. I invite you to be seated. All right. I invite you to be seated. So as we are uh, continuing in our study of the life of Jesus and hearing about things that Jesus would encourage us to do in our lives, we come upon this passage of scripture that tells us, don't worry. And he talks about a number of things not to worry about. Uh, certainly there is much more that Jesus talks to the disciples about in his Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'm only highlighting a few of the, the key pieces and things that I think are relevant for our community. Uh, but uh, if you want to get more in-depth with what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount, I just want to encourage you one more time to be a part of one of those small group experiences where we're really looking through each of those pieces of the Sermon on the Mount, discovering how we can live them out in our lives. Uh, it's an important part of how we grow in faith. But today, talking about worry, as I was talking with Parker, there's a lot of things we can be scared about, things we can be worried about, uh, and Jesus recognizes that is a very common piece for all of us to be concerned and worried about. Now, worry is a weird thing because we think that by worrying, somehow we can change things, but worry itself has no control over the circumstances around us. 
I, uh, several years ago, had a chance to uh, go on a boat trip where we were going to go snorkeling. It was a really fun adventure. Um, and so we, the, the captain was letting us know about what was going to happen, what things we're going to see when we get out there with the snorkel, and explained you know, both the life vest and the snorkel and the whole piece. And he also said this really interesting thing. He said, when we get to where we're going, I'm going to turn the engines of the, of the boat off, and then we're going to start feeling the waves. <laughs> And the best way to deal with the up and down of the waves is you got to get into the water. <laughs> and once you get in the water, you're going to see the beautiful fish and the, you'll be distracted by all the beautiful things around you. Don't stay on the boat. <laughs> and sure enough, when we got to where we were going, the, the captain turned the engine off of the boat and the boat started to rise and sink, rise and sink. And a few people started to huddle around their seats and huddle around the various places they could hold on to, and the rest of everyone else got into the water and was enjoying it. Guess what happened to the people who held on to the poles? They started feeling queasy and sick and lost their lunch, and were starting to feed the fish that the rest of us were enjoying <laughs> watching. And the problem with worry is that it has a paralyzing effect on our lives. It keeps us from enjoying and participating in the things that we're invited to be a part of. And our worry constrains us and keeps us holding on to things that are actually not helpful at all. But we get stuck in those positions. And Jesus wants to invite us to let go of some of those things that worry, that entraps us in life, so that we can might experience life more fully, to experience the fullness of God's benefits for us and what he would have for us. Three times in the scripture, he tells us, do not worry. It's not just an encouragement, it's a command. Do not worry. Because worry is directly in contrast to faith. He's encouraging us, instead of having worry, we should enjoy faith. And to recognize that uh, we, are, uh, we have a chance to enjoy a number of responsibilities and concerns that God gives to us. And those are our concerns. We need to take ownership of those things that are our responsibility, that we need to be concerned about and deal with. But worry is when our concerns start to own us. <laughs> when our concerns own us versus us being able to own our, our concerns and our responsibilities that we have. And recognize that there is a balance between the things that we actually can do and the things that are really outside of our concern, or outside of our ability to make any difference, any lasting difference in there. You might ask the question, is this something that I can actually make a difference in, or am I just worrying about things that I can't control? You know, for instance, we recognize that there is some great controversy, there's a, a great concern of what's happening in Ukraine over the in Russian invasion that's happening there. Now, I am not a military general, and I could be staying up all night worrying about what's happening to Ukrainian people. But my worry is not going to effectively change anything in Ukraine. It's outside of my sphere of control, something I have any ability to change. Now, if I, on the same hand, if I, if I were to be really worried and concerned about the fact that my toenails were growing really long and were cutting holes in my socks, you would say, stop being so worried about it, pick up some clippers and deal with it, right? God has given us some things we can do, and there's also many things we can't do. And so we have to understand the difference there. There's a great prayer. Some of you know this is the serenity prayer uh, by Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, he wrote, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and here's the key piece, the wisdom to know the difference. <laughs> it's important for us to understand what we can actually change and not be so worried or consumed by worry about the things that we really are outside of our control. And so Jesus wants the disciples to understand not to worry. He gives them that command several times. But what, and so as Jesus is talking about this contrast of worry and faith, he wants us to understand that we're supposed to embrace faith. And in order to overcome worry, it's not just saying, well, I'm going to stop worrying. But how is it that we overcome worry? We have to grow our understanding of who God is. To experience God in a bigger way, so we might embrace God's provision and care for us in a way that helps us realize that God's the one in control, even when we're not. And that we can trust him in the midst of this. I heard this fun story. A husband and a wife were making a, uh, a set of plans to go on a trip. And the first time the husband worked out the, uh, the plans for the trip, they required a uh, plane 
flight, uh, and the only plane that was available was a single-engine plane. It was Cessna, right? And you know, maybe it has 12 passengers that can fit on this plane. And the wife says, I am not getting on that plane. And the husband says, you have too little faith. And the wife said, you have too little plane. <laughs> Apparently later on, as the trip was being developed, they you know, moved to a different airport and there was a much bigger plane, a 737 that they were going to fly on. She says, I'll take that trip. He goes, you know, you had little faith. And she goes, well, now you have a bigger plane. <laughs> you have bigger faith, bigger plane. And the, the reason I tell that story is that it's a it's great understanding that in life, sometimes we do have too little faith. But the difference of our understanding of faith has to do with our view of God. Now, God doesn't change in size. Right? God is God. God is immense. God is almighty. But sometimes we have a very narrow understanding of what God can do. In fact, one of the things we might think about in the larger society of all the ways we kind of cut God out of places of our life. God's not allowed to deal with school stuff. <laughs> God's not allowed to deal with politics. God's not allowed to deal with you know, finances. Or, you know, those different ways we kind of push God into this nice little box. And then we say, okay, God is good in this little box of my life. God is enormous. <laughs> And when we have a myopic or a very small view of God, we miss out on the big piece of what God would have for us, how God wants to deal with the circumstances in our life, so he might understand, we might understand who God is and for us in our lives. And so we need to have a bigger view of God. So to overcome worry, we need to have and grow our understanding and our view of God to deal with our present dealings or circumstance of our lives. And so Jesus tells them that we need to, to look at the birds and the uh, flowers of the field as a way of example for help, having us understand what that looks like and how we deal with worry in those relationships with those things. Now, one of the things he's talking about with the birds is he recognizes that God provides for our needs, right? Look at the birds. They don't store up in uh, barns or they don't go to the bank and deposit their bird seed, uh, but God still provides for them every day. You know, the birds aren't wandering around, where am I going to get my, my next meal, right? But one of the things we recognize with the birds, while they are not worrying, standing around worrying, they're busy. <laughs> they're doing what they know they need to do which is going to find that grub, going to find that seed, going to find their next meal, because they know that's something that they can do. It's in their sphere of responsibilities. That they're going to do that. And they know that when they do their part, God provides. When they do their part, God provides. A lot of times, I think this issue with faith is that we're trying to do more <laughs> than what God asks us to do, or we're not willing to do the one piece that God asks us to do. You know, as a church, we've often wondered, like, how are we going to provide for all the ministries that God calls us to be about? And God says, provide for me your tithe. Provide for me what I've given to you. One portion of that. If you give that to God, because that belongs to God, if you give it to God as a responsibility we have to give to God, God will provide for all that is required. But God, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> And so we end up with this doubt and this worry, this concern about whether or not we're actually able to fund the ministries that God calls us to do. Well, at the same time, we're not letting God be in charge of our pocketbook. <laughs> Just one interesting example. But maybe there's other areas of your life that you recognize that you've not been willing to yield to God the responsibility that we have for those and haven't actually followed through on what God has asked you to do. And then we spend our time worrying whether or not there's actually going to be provision for that. What we see from this example from the birds is that instead of worrying about it, they actually follow through. They know their responsibilities and they do it. And they see the result as a, as a piece of that. The other piece about this story is we recognize that there is this understanding of God who is a loving God. God who is a heavenly father. The one who provides for his family. And I recognize that there's many people who haven't understood a loving father, and I'm really, uh, I'm really sad about that. Because the truth is that a loving parent who cares for us is such an important piece of who we are. In fact, it's been written that we can only love to the same degree that we have received and experienced love in our own life. And so it grieves me when I recognize there's people who've not understood, experienced love in that grand kind of way. But the truth is that God is a good and loving God. A God who provides for our every need, who comes near to us when we are in pain. I, I was describing with Parker about you know, being scared at night you know, and having the night light and you know, hiding under the blankets, which have a magical uh, ability to ward off all kinds of monsters, right? I, I had a, um, 
my sister-in-law, apparently when she was a child, had a hard time with uh, getting to sleep at night as well. And the parents came in and told her, well, God is with you. And her response is, I just really want somebody with flesh on. <laughs> a good response. But the thing is that God cares enough, and we see this in the person of Jesus. God knows that we need to know that relationship with us and came in the very person of Jesus Christ, one with flesh on, so we would know the full extent of his love, that he lived among us and died for us, that there is now nothing that can separate us from the immensity of God's love for us. I talk about needing to adjust our view or grow our understanding of faith of God, but as we recognize how much God has given to us, it helps to open our heart to realize the love of God, which is always available for us if we simply open our hands and say, Lord, I need more of you in my life. It gives us that opportunity to experience God in a loving and powerful relationship. Even if in our human relationships they have been deficient, they have not experienced that love with God, it is there. That God's love is available for all to receive. This is why Jesus came in the flesh. And, and the other time we see in Scripture where it talks about being of little faith, Jesus was on a boat. And in the picture that I'm showing on the screen, Jesus is sleeping on this boat. Uh, the disciples have you know, been charged with taking the boat from one shore to the next. And as they are in the midst of this storm, they are busy trying to figure out how to keep the boat afloat. They're taking their buckets and throwing the water over the bo overboard, and they're, they're uh, doing all they can to paddle, and they're doing with it what they need to to get with the sail. And here it is, Jesus is with them, but they don't benefit from that experience until they ask God to take charge. And what happens? Jesus stands up, and even with simple words, to be still, the waves become calm, and the wind ceases. God wants us to know of his provision, his power to overcome the obstacles in our life as Jesus steps into our circumstances, those storms of life. And we provide calm in the midst of that storm. And Jesus says to the disciples, ye of little faith, didn't you know I was with you? That the, the power of God was available? This story helps us to realize that God cares for his people. That we are not left alone in our concerns and our worries, but he walks with us and, and encourages us to enjoy that relationship with God. A God who loves us, a God who is able to overcome not just the winds and the storms, but our, our struggles with our food and our finances and our provisions and whether or not we've got the right kind of threads. God cares about all of those things because he is a loving and caring God. So we need to put worry in its place. <laughs> Jesus commands us not to worry. He said that three times. Do not worry. He commands it. It's not just an encouragement, just not a, a thought of, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't. It's, don't worry. Trust God. Have faith. As we understand it and expand our understanding of who God is, we understand this more. And he says this way. He says, we need to put God first in our lives. Not the things. He says, you know, the pagans chase after the clothing and, the, and the, you know, whether or not they're going to get the next food and they're, they're all the financial stuff that seems to be the primary uh, focus for the worldly ambitions of where we could go. He says, God knows that you need all these things. All you got to do is put God first. But if you don't pursue God first, seek first the kingdom of God, these things will continue to be a struggle. These things will continue to be a worry. They'll continue to be the, the waves of the storm that will seek to sink your boat. But trust God first, because God knows that you need these things, and he will provide all that is needed. And how do we do that? How do we set God first? Well, that means we need to put God in the center of our decision-making world. You know, it used to be said, you've got to put God on the throne of your life. You know, but put God in the decision-making part of your world. I know that uh, in my life there's a lot of decisions I make each day. I think they're saying each person makes at last 3,000 decisions in a day. And you know, some of those decisions are you know, whether or not to get out of bed in the morning or hit the snooze alarm or what breakfast you're going to eat or whatever, those simple decisions. So about 3,000 we make in a day. Do we allow for God to be the core piece of how we are making our decisions? Do we, do we allow for that to be part of our life experience, to trust God with some of those bigger decisions of where we're at? Or do we make our decisions, and often what happens, you know, I've decided what I need to do, and I need to ask God to bless it. 
That is like asking, you know, the cart to drive the horse or, you know, the washing machine to somehow, you know, put on your clothes for you. It's just the wrong way around, right? It doesn't work that way. So setting God is the decision-making part of our life. The other thing he says is don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worry of its own. You know, worry about today or allow for today to be all that is there. It, and I was talking with a pastor recently, and we're talking about what happens with the church, and often we're thinking about, you know, some sort of way of reliving the golden past of all those wonderful things of where we were, and somehow that misses the focus of where we are today. But also in the same problems, thinking about where we could be in the future and some sort of dream out there that is keeping us from having a true vision of who we are and what we are now. What are the gifts and graces that God is equipping us with at the moment Instead of having these other sort of outsourced vision that miss us the focus of where we are in life, we miss out on being present today with what God is calling us to be. So to put worry in its place is to allow for tomorrow to worry about itself. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because God's got that. What we have in front of us is the responsibility and concerns that God has given us today to work with. Now, as I've been sharing about this, often I use church examples because as a pastor, that's my primary area of concern. But in your life, I bet there are all kinds of things that you find yourself bogged down and worry with, whether it be a relationship, maybe it's even this COVID thing. I know recently we've had this wave of COVID go through our community, and the truth is that COVID's going to come and go. Where are we in our life with God? Are we going to trust Him with our life? Trust Him with these things? Whatever that concern is in your life, whether it be finances, food, or, or those right threads, the encouragement from the scripture today is do not worry. Do not worry, but trust God. Allow for the God who loves you to come and welcome you in his arms, that you might know of his embrace and his care for you. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the many ways you continue to walk with us through the basic things of life. We know our worries, and you know that we get worried by things, but your invitation for us is to set our worries into your hands, knowing that you are the one who created all things, who provides all things for us. And so I hear how it grieves your heart that we would put these worries out as if we would distrust your way of caring for us and providing for us as your people. So God, help us to put our faith in you to trust you with what you've given us today, that we would be faithful as we follow you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond by singing hymn number 397, I Need Thee Every Hour. I invite us to stand as we sing together.
invite you to be seated. We recognize our need of God who provides for us and blesses us in our lives. As we uh, come to this time of worship, we have an opportunity to respond with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. As you note that we have offering there in the back, we invite you to make use of that as you would feel led by God. For those of you who are watching online, note that it is possible to give through the website. The listing is there on the screen. And for, or to mail in your offerings, as however you might feel led uh, to respond as God is leading you in your life. And as we recognize the many ways that God continues to provide for us, I invite us to respond with prayer of thanksgiving together. So let us pray. God, we thank you for the many ways you continue to care for us as your people. Even as we hear the story of the birds and the flowers and the ways you have cared for even the smallest of things, how much more even that you care for us, providing for our daily needs, guiding us, providing our, your love, your care for us. And so, Lord, as we respond with these gifts, help us to be faithful with all that we have, that indeed we would be faithful in the building of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let us sing the doxology together. We have an opportunity now to share in our joys and concerns. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, feel free to uh, lift up any prayer concerns that you would have. We'd be able to lift them up. Uh, Lori will probably yell them out for me <laughs> if we see them, so we'll make uh, use of that. Uh, as we gather here, what concerns or joys do you have that you'd want to lift up together as a people of faith? Charlene? Prayers for Ryan Lang's family and uh, for all those who grieve his loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Ruthie. Um, we would like prayers for our daughter, Jennifer. Um, she's been very ill, and um, she's had to go into the emergency room a couple of times. Okay. And she has really, really bad migraine headaches. Okay. Okay. So prayers for Jennifer and for her healing and the diagnosis of what's going on. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayers. Yes. Um, I have open heart surgery coming up in March. Okay. Yeah. So lift up you in prayer for your healing as you go for the uh, heart surgery that's coming up. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. One on mine, uh, prayer for Janice Bigelow. All right. Prayers for Janice Bigelow. Uh, Lord be with you. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I know that uh, as we gather here, I know of many people who are currently sick with COVID. And uh, so we want to lift up all of those who are not able to join us in person as they're working through their uh, illness and whichever way that is hitting them. Uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Others, uh, we want to share joys or concerns. Yeah. That Indeed. So we lift up our nation and the world and that we might seek the Lord together. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yeah. Pastor Mark, we pray for next week on Friday. She's going to be going to the baby Pennsylvania to visit her brother and sister and visit for the next two weeks. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, so Cass, as you go on your trip, We'll be in prayer for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Very good. Also, prayers for the vows that we take in Turkey. Yeah. Yeah. For the many in Turkey and Syria who uh, have been impacted by the earthquake. We hear about the tens of thousands of persons who have died this last week in that experience or that uh, devastation. And so we pray for the the nations around and for those countries as they try to rebuild and, and to be restored in that process and those who are suffering currently in this winter season uh, there. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Any others? Yeah. Yeah. 
We have right. Amen. Uh, Ruthie's lifting up that uh, Chris Steves. I put together this beautiful tree. Uh, we decided we're just going to decorate it for the different seasons instead of putting it away. And uh, so it's decorated for Valentine's Day, but recognition that God's love is for all of us. And so thank you, Chrissy, uh, for putting that together for us. It's just beautiful. Uh, maybe at the end, I'll turn the camera so we can get a better view of that at the end of the service. All right. Any others we want to lift up and joys or concerns today? Let us join our hearts in prayer today. Lord, we thank you for the abundance of your love. That you continue to chase after us, no matter where we are in our lives, no matter what we have done, no matter our concerns or worries, Lord, that your spirit continues to call out to us, inviting us to know of who you are and your ways that you care for us and your abundance of your love. Inviting us to trust you with each area of our life, from the smallest concern to the biggest worry, Lord, you are there. You are here with us. And recognizing, Lord, that we are not alone. And Lord, we've lifted up before you in this time of worship persons in our community who are in grief of loss, persons who are in need of your healing hand, helping them to understand what is going on in, the, in their bodies. We lift up those who are dealing with COVID, and God, we continue to wrestle through this uh, tail end of the pandemic, wishing, Lord, that it would just go away. God, we know that this is in your time. We ask that you would continue to reassure us with your presence and your guidance and your wisdom. We lift up all of those who are grieving and lost around the world, particularly for those who've lost their lives, the families who've lost members of their household there in Syria and Turkey. We lift up those who are traveling in this season. God, that your mercy would be felt among them. And Lord, we know of all these concerns that you, you, are, you are with us, and that we are not alone in this journey of life, that you came in the very person of Jesus to calm the storm for the disciples, that they would experience a moment of your peace, a relationship that you offer freely to all who would call to you. And so it is in his name that we pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our last song today is My Hope is Built. It's hymn number 368. We trust in God in the midst of our worries. I invite us to stand as we sing together.
As we uh, close our service together, I'll invite you to join us downstairs for some refreshments. Uh, know that they were uh, putting together some beautiful Valentine refreshments, so I invite us to enjoy those together. And as we close our service, I invite you to turn your hearts and your hands to God in whatever way is comfortable for you. And Lord, that you would continue to pour out your spirit on us as we gather and as we hear these words, that we might know of your comfort, your guidance, and your provision, knowing that you are the one who is the Lord of all life, that you might lead us forth to share of your good news, that all might know of your love. And this we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.